Okay, here we are. This is Think Tech. It's Thursday. We're here in Honolulu, in, in the core of downtown Honolulu, in Pioneer Plaza, uh, where Think Tech lives. And we are talking with uh, our host, Avram Goodblatt, in Philadelphia. And with Avram is uh, Drew Folks, uh, his guest. And we are excited to be able to do shows this way. You guys could be in uh, Biro Bijan, be the same thing. Uh, so we like to have distance and get perspective on things. And today we're going to call this show Computing for the Masses, and more specifically the episode uh, Better Coding Through Better code, Co-Working. Co-Working meaning, uh, you know, the way you bring people together in a given location and let them stop by and do their business and network and, and sometimes uh, make, make a meal in the kitchen, actually. That's what we have here in Honolulu. Anyway, uh, so uh, let, me, let me give it to you, uh, Avram Goodblatt, Goodblad, uh, take it from here, and let's see uh, what you guys have to say. Thank you, Jay. And uh, hello in nice, warm, sunny Honolulu in the middle of the day. This is Philadelphia, where it's cold and it's in the evening. So have some compassion on us. In the meantime, a Drew... Um, this is Drew Folks. Um, thank you for the opportunity to interview you for Think Tech Hawaii. You are the community manager for this co-working space, which is called City Coho. Yes. Okay. And I understand it's in partnership with Nexus. Yes, it's in partnership with a nonprofit that's focused primarily on building community within the sustainability movement. So you're a sustainable co-working space. Well, I feel like sustainable is kind of a loaded word, but we definitely encompass values that have to do with sustainability, and we try to create a healthy, safe, and relaxing space for people to actively work on, on projects. Our, our, our space is really for, for professional iterate. So give us a little bit of background. How long you've been involved in co-working? I, my first foray into co-working was about two years ago. I was working as a... Um, a director of business development for a electronics recycling company here in Philadelphia. Um, primarily, my motivation to get involved with co-working was out of uh, the sheer boredom and monotony of working at home, um, and the, the the fact that I felt kind of uh, culturally isolated from my peers who are out in the world working in offices. Um, so I kind of got involved in the local scene. There's many spaces in Philadelphia. I think. The last time I checked, there was somewhere around 36 spaces in the Philadelphia area and more opening every day. There's national co-working chains that are coming to Philadelphia because they see it as a growing market. There's um, you know grassroots co-working spaces that are opening with entrepreneurs in Philadelphia. Um, and my experience with it was primarily I came there to network and uh, meet fellow entrepreneurs that were doing what I was doing. So how did this vision of a, a sustainable Ability-oriented co-working space come about. So it really, um, the idea of a sustainability co-working space had largely to do with some observations we made about the sustainability movement as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something that we talk about. Um, we, we we talk about classic symptoms of disintegration a lot, and I'll break down basically what that means. Um, any movement has the capability to fall victim to um, miscommunication, lack of, lack of communication, adversarial relationships between would-be allies, basically things that kill collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found with the sustainability movement, um, after reading uh, a book by uh, a really wonderful sustainability thought leader named Paul Hawkins, mm -hmm. um, he wrote Blessed Unrest. And Blessed Unrest, um, in addition to being a very kind of poetic and uh, really nice kind of way of categorizing the sustainability movement and kind of like rallying people around these principles, uh, Paul Hawken and his team started creating an inventory of all the organizations in the world that were working actively within sustainability. And for us, our definition of that is the bottom line. So companies that understand their economic uh, impact on the world, their cultural and societal impact on the world, and their environmental impact on the world. Um, and him and his team thought they'd find about 50,000 organizations, uh, given what they knew about the movement as a whole. And over the course of the year, they stopped counting. 
about 100,000 organizations. And they think that there is somewhere between 250 and 500,000 organizations that are working within the sustainability movement. Um, which means by the numbers, it's the largest movement in human history. Let's back up a second and talk about sustainability. Sure. And, and how this co-working space is sustainable vis-a-vis -vis another co-working space which you would not necessarily categorize as sustainable. Yeah, I mean, well, the purpose of this space is really to provide a home and a community um, for the sustainability movement in Philadelphia. Um, and what we've done to reflect that mission of building community within that movement and avoiding those, what I would call classic symptoms of disintegration, is to provide a space that really adequately reflects the values of the people working with us. So if you go to a, an office of, say, an uh, organization that is working to combat climate change, um, chances are they're working in an office that has carpet on the floor, old paint on the walls, you know, really horrible lighting, very limited natural light. It's, for the most part, an environment that you wouldn't really want to work in every day. Um, so imagine people working for organizations in which they're dealing with the scariest issues facing humanity, and they have to work in a space that adversely affects them on a daily basis. Now, I know at least one of your clients or members is um, based on the internet in terms of the work they're doing. You mentioned it to me when I stepped in today. Um, Twitter, you are you? Oh, of course. Um, that, so currently, we're uh, the ride sharing app Lyft is launching in Philadelphia, and right now above me, they're having uh, their big party to rally all the drivers that are about to hit the street tomorrow. Um, yeah. Why did Why did they say they chose you? Well, a lot of it had to do with the kind of space that we were running in terms of the environment. A lot of it had to do with proximity to rail and public spaces. A lot of it had to do with the fact that they thought they could build a relationship with our space, um, and that we were willing to, you know, help them along with their launch in Philadelphia. Um, I think a lot of companies now are starting to understand it's not a fad, it's something that you really have to build in your model. And at its most basic definition, sustainability is a condition in which you can indefinitely preserve life. And people want to build companies that are thinking of, are, are making decisions long term enough that they're not just going to be a flash in the pan company, they're going to be a, a long term sustainable business that understands their impact on multiple different levels, whether it's um, their impact to their environment, their impact to society, and by, by having this holistic perspective of their company, they're building bigger and stronger brands. Can you think of a specific relationship between that and the particular needs of people doing uh, startups that are coding intensive? Sure, I mean, um, if you, uh, we do a lot of work in Philadelphia with uh, the local Code for America chapter, uh, Code for Philly. Um, and a lot of the people who engage in that organization um, believe that they can put their skills towards something that really benefits humanity. They're building life sharing apps, they're building um, earth, like vacant lot calculators, they're like geotagging apps so that people can find better access to medicine. They're realizing that they can put their skills towards something that's really valuable and they can build social credibility that way. So these are not just individual people building each one their own app, but groups of people working together in this, uh, this environment? Yeah, and a lot of the collaboration happens because people shed their role, their daily role. Um, in a, an organization like Code for Philly, you get to see technologists who work for, they could work for hundreds of different dev shops around the city. And for that three hour period, you know, once a week, they are themselves and they are dedicated to their issue. That is how, that's how they network. They network around do Um They're actively giving back and they're also, they're building their professional credibility. They're working on something that actually speaks to them. Because people want to work on things that really reflect their values and feel like they're actually giving back. A generalization about people in coding, <laughs> which I'm not saying it's true, but it's a generalization, sure, um, is to emphasize 
the geeky side of it, <laughs> like we see in, let's say, Big Bang Theory or something so we like that. Yeah. Where I wouldn't say Big Bang Theory necessarily categorizes as most technologists, but I mean. No, no, exactly. <laughs> My point is there is a, a attitude that of people involved in computers, they have poor social skills, they don't really want to work together with other people, they want to sit, write their own code, and just get on with it. Now, that's the generalization, the myth. Yeah. From your experience, what do you think is happening with coding these days? I think people are people. And I would say from my personal experience, um, that's contrary to what I've seen. Most of the technologists and developers that I've met are have better social skills than most business development people that I know. Um, most dev shops nowadays are emphasizing that they coders that can also interact with clients and interface with clients. Because what the information is going to be at best quality when the person actually developing the program for you mm -hmm. is the one actually speaking to you about what they're going to do. Um, so for instance, we have a, a, a couple of members in the space who are for ThoughtBot out of Cambridge in Boston. And ThoughtBot emphasizes a program in which all of their developers are also their salespeople, in which they have to book their meetings and interact with their clients and actually give valuable information and then build the product. And by decentralizing, um, you know, by breaking out a role and having cross-functional roles, you're now a salesperson, you're a developer, your client gets better information. And they actually, there's no middleman to convey what they want. You can have a genuine conversation with them. You know, uh, Drew, I'm, I'm wondering um, how big a company, you know, can get in a co-working space. Uh, you know, if, if it's a successful entrepreneurial experience, uh, it's going to be more than one person, uh, and it grows <coughs> and topsy, and you got all these, you know, um, specialization of functions happening. So query, you know, can a co-working space accommodate a company, say, with half a dozen people, all of whom need a place to sit down and work, especially the the, the people who code and require a quiet place to work, uh, or do <coughs> you have a a kind of a guideline about when they're ready to graduate, you know, the concept of graduating out of an incubator. Uh, what, what's your experience on that? How long do they stay when they're growing? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a, a basic definition. There's a, there's a difference between an incubator and a co-working community. Sure. Incubators may operate in co-working communities, but, um, Incubators are focused on accelerating, incubating, and cultivating entrepreneurship. Co-working spaces are collaborative communities in which people in any stage of the company can interact. So I, I think the best example is uh, Fidelity just bought 7,000 co-working seats at WeWork in Boston. Oh my God. I know. That's ambitious. It, well, they understand that by being in a community where you're surrounded by other people working for other organizations, you get to shed your flag of, I belong to this organization. You actually get to interact with people that you wouldn't normally have the possibility to interact with. Mm -hmm. And companies as big as Fidelity are seeing that innovation. They're seeing that by putting somebody in a community in which they can actually thrive and really express their ideas, and in a space where their ideas are cultivated and nurtured, they're going to get better business. They're going to, they're going to make better business decisions. Well, let's, uh, um, Drew, let's take a short break. Pardon me for interrupting. Uh, sure. To do our promotionals, and uh, we'll come back. That's, that's Drew, folks. Uh, he's uh, uh, managing a co-working space uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, our host is Avram Goodblatt. And he's the host of Computing for the Masses. And today we're talking loosely about better coding uh, through uh, uh, co-working. And I, you know, I might suggest that when we come back, maybe you guys could talk about something that uh, Drew touched on a moment ago, which suggests to me that co-working is growing like Topsy. Uh, its <laughs> models must be changing. But more than that, it sounds like it's becoming a national phenomenon, which will ultimately consolidate. Instead of having a million zillion different owners and arrangements, it sounds like if you look forward for five or ten years, you will see consolidation. Let's take this short break and maybe you can handle that when we come back. Sure. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, 
president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with uh, with our host in Philadelphia. That's Avram Goodblatt, uh, and his guest uh, Drew Fox, who is a co-working manager in Philadelphia, here on Computing for the Masses, where they are discussing, among other things, better coding through co-working. Uh, take it away, Avram. Well, let's get back to discussing the future of co-working. What do you think is going to be happening with it? You mentioned that um, investment of fidelity, not investment, but participation in that specific co-working, uh, which is a national operation, right? Yeah. What was the name of it again? Uh, that's the largest base in the country, which is WeWork, mm -hmm. um, based out of New York. They have something like 34 locations uh, across the world. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the other biggest one is probably the Impact Hub Network, which is an international network of actually socially focused organizations, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of the inspiration for this space came from um, some of the things that we've seen the Impact Hub Network do. I'd like to give another example of something that started in Philly and now has taken over as part of the national operation. Um, we've been a member of uh, CarShare <laughs> Sorry to hear uh, the Philly car share. Philly car share, yeah. which was recently bought by Enterprise. Yeah. And that was just another piece of the Enterprise uh, nationwide. Like the car is owned by Adidas. That's right. Yeah. Um, it was a good idea. It was a local community initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, good attitude. We enjoyed working, being part of it. And now it's national. We're just another small cog in a national operation. Um, What's your plan for this place regarding that? I mean, I see this place expanding. Uh, we currently, this is our mothership. Like, this is our number one location. Um, we're expanding to another location in Philadelphia in the next year. Um, we're opening one in Mount Airy. And oh. Mount, Mount Airy is, is famous nationwide for being one of the most diverse communities in the country. Um, and it really, the values of that community really fit the values of our organization in that space. Um, very kind of socially and eco-minded people. So you think they'll, five years from now, there'll still be a place in the larger picture while these other large companies grow and grow? Yeah, I absolutely think so. Co-working is not something that it's going to be bought off by some multinational conglomerate. It's going to be, there's always going to be spaces in different cities that represent different communities. Mm -hmm. Because that's the, the forefront of it. It's really, it's not about the space. It's not really about the business, it's about the community that you're building. Like this space would be nothing without its people. Um, and we really, we're building a space to serve the needs of the community, not really building a community to serve the business of the space. In the co-working spaces that I've seen or used, there is a spectrum of interest to the extent in which they feel that they're providing a community service. Mm -hmm. Some co-working spaces seem to be mostly they have a seat, provide some infrastructure, and they stop there. Mm -hmm. um, where would you characterize these national co-working spaces on that spectrum? You put yourselves at one end of saying you're extremely community-oriented, and at the other end, here, here's a chair, go use it. Where would you place these national operations in that spectrum? Well, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer because so much depends on the, the space itself. It might, you know, have allegiance to a, a national co-working chain, but it really has to do with the community manager and the community there. 
whether they're actually cultivating a community. Do all the working spaces usually have a community manager? Yeah, I would say so. They at least have somebody that, you know, originally called himself an office manager and then kind of slips into the role of a community manager. But I would say, I'll say this enough for me to say, I think that the, the spaces that are focused on the real estate aspect of it, the ones that are focused on, you know, we're going to maximize profits by we can fit this many people into the space at a time, and, you know, that's more than we get for the square footage of the rent. The people that aren't thinking about cultivating the community, those are the spaces you're going to see shut, shut their doors in the next 10 years. What metrics? do you use or are you planning to use in say a year from now to evaluate whether you're going in the right direction for yourselves or not? I mean, obviously there's economic metrics, whether we're solvent, that you know, helps. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the metrics that we use is how many connections we make. You know, how many organizations that we bring together that didn't know about each other. Mm -hmm. So really like the, the forefront of what we're doing here has to do with match making between organizations who are shared Admission. For instance, um, through our nonprofit and through the infrastructure of the space, we're launching a uh, what we're calling the Climate Nexus of Philadelphia, which is a coalition of over 75 climate-focused organizations that otherwise wouldn't have, or maybe had the opportunity, but really didn't capitalize on the opportunity to collaborate. Um, so, for Sierra Club is uh, an organization that's a member of this space. And they get to use this infrastructure so that they can collaborate with other organizations and kind of use us as the connected tissue to facilitate that interaction. So it's like we are the ones who are putting together, you know, the admin support. We're the ones doing, um, giving them the physical infrastructure for meetings and events. And we're the ones really kind of acting as that connected tissue. Are you familiar with the word fascia? You know, it's the, the, yeah, the tissue inside of you is the reason that, like, when you jump up and down, your heart doesn't fall out your bottom. Yeah. Um, think of Nexus, the organization that's really running the culture and community of this space, as the fascia for the sustainability movement. We're the ones who are taking a meta and kind of backseat role, who are acting as the matchmakers, but aren't actually executing the work. What do you think the biggest mistake it's possible to make in setting up a co-working space? I think completely ignoring your community and thinking that it's strictly a real estate play. And I think there's a lot of spaces that have done that. Um, one of the big co-working fault leaders in Philadelphia is a guy named Alex Hillman. And Alex started Indie Hall in 2006. Indie Hall is a really great example of, they looked at the space as, we already have a community, now we need a clubhouse to make sure that we can all code and work together. Um, Alex and the Indie Hall guys would crash coffee shops. They would, you know, they would meet up at people's houses. They would meet up at restaurants. Um, it didn't matter where the space was. It totally was, it wasn't important to them. They wanted the community. And they saw what could be built for community. The space came in 2006 when they finally signed a lease for a place on, I think, Strawberry Street in Philadelphia. Um, hey, would you like yeah. to interject something? Well, I was, actually, what I was uh, thinking was we needed to take a break, if you don't mind, a uh, second break of the show, not to interrupt. But we have uh, Drew Folks, a co-working manager in Philadelphia, uh, and we have our host in Philadelphia, uh, the host of Computing for the Masses, and that's Avram Goodblatt. We're talking about better coding through co-working. We're going to take a short break at this point. We'll be right back, gentlemen. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at ThinkTech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. And we're okay, we're back, we're live, we're here with you guys. Drew Fox, uh, a co-working manager in Philadelphia, and Avram Goodblatt, our host uh, in Philadelphia on Computing for the Masses, which is noon in Hawaii uh, every Thursday. And today we're talking about better coding through better code uh, co-working. One thing, I, let me insinuate this one thought. We only have maybe five or eight minutes left here. 
Um, so I just want to add this one thought. You know, uh, we do a lot of interviews of research, uh, research uh, groups uh, at UH. And uh, they are very ambitious, and I must say they're impressive. Um, and I'm wondering if there's room for research groups in a co-working space. I mean, it would have to be modular. It would have to have a certain amount of privacy, maybe even confidentiality, depending. It would have to have, um, you know, uh, boundaries, essentially, f for the conduct of research. Um, for example, if we we're going to do research involving a laboratory, or for that matter, an IT laboratory, would they be able to do that in a co-working space, or would they? Would you send them away for some other space? Um, so you know, I know that some some people, for example, I remember a story in the Times about a group in in Brooklyn who decided they were going to get some very sophisticated and uh, expensive equipment in order to do their. And they were all in other areas, but they were very curious. They wanted to get together and do science together, so they took a, a lease of a loft. And they bought this equipment and put it in the loft. And um, now that might have been a co-working space now these days. I'm just wondering if there's room for that kind of thing for scientific research. Can you cure cancer, you know, by work in a co-working space, or is that simply outside the box? Uh, very simply put, um, co-working really has to do with providing benefit by providing shared resources. So in, think of like when you, if you're setting up a lab, you know, think of all the equipment and all the expenses that go into setting up a lab and think about how much time that equipment is not being used. And you're still paying for that equipment. You've still sunk your cost into buying that equipment no matter how much someone's using it. Um, I think a really great, very, very specific example of, of how that question is been done in real life is in Philadelphia we have um, we have an organization that's called the Science Center that is in a long-term partnership with Drexel University. The Science Center is a collection of um, of buildings on Market Street in West Philadelphia, um, which has spaces exactly like that. It's shared laboratory space. It's shared maker space. It's um, it's equipment that can be incredibly expensive and underutilized and what they're doing is they're pro because they can get so many people able to use that equipment they're able to find better efficiency through sharing that equipment um, for instance that one of the, the big trends in co-working right now is the emergence of maker spaces um, there's a couple here in Philadelphia the most notable is probably next fab here in Philly um, next fab has a three thousand dollar 3d printer and you know, thousands of dollars worth of mechanical tools and laser cutters and water etchers and things that, you know, if you bought yourself and made your own workshop, would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. But what they do is they simply provide memberships to be able to have access to that equipment. And what's happening is that not only do people have access to shared equipment, but they get access to a community in which people are actively learning from one another to be more effective on that equipment. So you get the resources, you get the community, you get the knowledge, and you get the shared space in which you can all work together. Um, and what that's leading to is it's leading to a lack of competitiveness between these groups. That uh, organization that, you know, say to go back to the laboratory scenario, say if one organization is working on one, you know, specific protein inhibitor and there's another lab that's using the same equipment next to them that's working on something similar, then they benefit from the shared knowledge that they get from simply being the proximity of one another and learning how to use that equipment together. Things like this are sometimes done within the academic environment in what they call shared facilities. Mm -hmm. um, however, I wouldn't say that the human component is necessarily um, intensively dealt with. Um, however, they are moving in that direction in that what you alluded to this already, uh, just because you have equipment doesn't mean you're not going to use it well. <laughs> yeah. And I don't mean that you haven't read the manual, but you don't know how to use it in creative ways to achieve the kind of results that you're looking for. How to use it to its best effort. And what you're saying is in a co-working space, 
whether they're in the same area or in different areas, they all can share the knowledge of how to get the best out of the particular shared uh, infrastructure, the shared equipment that they're spending so much money on. I mean, a three thousand dollar printer is nothing. I've seen places that have to spend a million dollars on a microscope. <laughs> And yet, after spending a million dollars on the microscope, they had neglected to pay for someone who knew how to run the microscope. Or even worse, someone who just knew how to do the quality control to make sure it was working properly. Mm -hmm. so these are what you would consider obvious things that are hard to believe, but uh, what you're doing is in a sense looking at the entire picture, not just the equipment, but what's its ecosystem around the equipment. Mm -hmm. And you consider a co-working space part of building that ecosystem around the different sets of infrastructure. You're not just providing a, a desk and a chair, you're providing knowledge on how to make the best use of that desk and chair. Yeah, and that's the value. That's the value proposition. It's not, we're going to give you a place to work, it's we're going to give you a community to work in. And that's the difference between a space that succeeds and a space that fails. Well, gentlemen, I think we're out of time. I uh, really appreciate this conversation. Very instructive about co-working, and we've had uh, the growth, uh, remarkable growth of co-working here in, in Honolulu. We don't have nearly the same as you had, neither number in, as you have in Philadelphia or in other cities on the mainland, but we are definitely on the same wave, and uh, I'm sure that the people in the co-working spaces here are trading ideas with the co-working spaces there. And uh, uh, Drew uh, and uh, Avram, when you guys get out here, you should check it out and see about these co-working spaces. I think you can probably learn a few things from them, you know, here in the, in the state of paradise. And, um, and they can learn a lot from you, that's for sure. Anyway, that's Drew Fox, uh, co-working manager uh, in Philadelphia, and our host in Philadelphia, uh, Avram Goodblatt. Uh, on computing for the masses, we've been talking about better coding through better co-working and other things relating to co-working spaces. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Aloha. Bye. We're going to move on to Global Connections with Carlos Juarez. See you next week. Thank you, Avram. <laughs>